Welcome back to God's Hand in Our Lives video Sunday School Lessons. We're going to be considering the lesson of the death and the burial of Jesus today. I want you to think about this question as we begin this lesson. Have you ever gone to a funeral before? Have you ever visited a visitation when someone has passed away? If you've ever gone to a place like that, either at church or at a funeral home, you know that there are many times a lot of people that gather together at that funeral in order to encourage the family and to show their support. Well, today we're going to be considering the funeral of Jesus. But there weren't a lot of people that were there, even though he was a very famous and popular person. It would be just a handful of people. But we're going to consider the death and the suffering of Jesus, all that he went through as well as his burial. We're also going to take a look at what that suffering and death was all about, what it means to us. In this lesson, we're going to reflect on the fact that in the death and the suffering of Jesus, through his burial, God accomplished the plan of redemption that he had set out to do. Jesus did all of that in our place. And as a result, we are redeemed. We have salvation. Let's begin this morning with prayer. Lord, I am ready and willing to search the scriptures today for the truth about my Savior and to reflect on who I am in his sight. I want to know Jesus first, myself second, and then everyone else as people you have loved so unselfishly. In your name we pray. Amen. This lesson on the death and the burial of Jesus is going to pick up where our last lesson left off. In the last lesson, we considered the crucifixion of Jesus and all of the suffering, the agony that he went through leading up to the crucifixion and at the crucifixion there on Calvary. Now, this lesson is going to pick up and back up and review just a little bit of what we've already covered with the actual death of Jesus, some of the words that he spoke on the cross, the signs that we saw last week that brought about God's display of what he accomplished there in the death of Jesus. And then we're going to move ahead to the burial of Jesus and its significance and its meaning for us today. Since the first part of this lesson is going to review what we covered in the previous lesson, I'm going to read through it fairly quickly and we'll talk a little bit about the meaning of that and some of the new details that have been added because this is a harmony, a part of all four of the Gospels being brought together into one account. We start about halfway down the first page of our lesson. And it was about the sixth hour. Then the sun was darkened. From this hour, darkness fell over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And when some of those who stood by heard that, they said, Look, this man is calling for Elijah. After this, Jesus, seeing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there. Then immediately someone ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed on hyssop, and put it to his mouth and offered it to him to drink. He and the others said, Let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to save him and take him down. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And when Jesus had cried out again with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And having said this, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit and breathed his last. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split, and the graves were opened. And many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Now, when the centurion who stood opposite Jesus saw what had happened, and that he cried out like this, he glorified God, saying, Certainly 
this was a righteous man. When the centurion and those who were with him, who were guarding Jesus, saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this man was the Son of God. So to that point in our lesson, this reviews what we covered in the previous lesson in the crucifixion of Jesus. And if you haven't covered that lesson, you might want to back up and review that lesson because it has a little bit more detail. But here we see the death of Jesus, that Jesus endured all of this suffering on our behalf. He was forsaken by God in our place. And finally, he willingly gave up his life in order to die the death that we deserved to die. Now, the people that were there at the cross of Jesus, they realized what was going on. They recognized that in these signs that they saw, the earthquake and the darkness, that Jesus must have been who he said he was. Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews, the Son of God, that he was indeed innocent of the things that he had been charged with, that he was indeed righteous. It's amazing to see how these Roman soldiers, they weren't even Jewish, they recognized the truth about who Jesus was, even though many of Jesus' own people, the Jewish leaders and others, failed to recognize this truth. Our account picks up with now the response also of the crowd on that day. And the whole crowd who came together to that site, seeing what had been done, beat their breasts and returned. But all his acquaintances and many women also were there, standing at a distance, looking on from afar, watching these things. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the Less and of Joses, and Salome the mother of Je Zebedee's sons. When Jesus was in Galilee, they followed him and ministered to him, and they had followed him from Galilee, ministering to him. And there were many other women who had accompanied him from Galilee and came up with him to Jerusalem. The Gospels tell us that on the day of the crucifixion of Jesus on Good Friday, that there were some of his followers who were there standing at a distance and watching what was taking place. We don't find the disciples, those 12 men that Jesus had chosen there outside of John, John's gospel does tell us that John was there. We heard about that in the previous lesson when Jesus told John to take care of his mother in his place. But the rest of the disciples were in hiding. It was the women who gathered there, who took care of Jesus during his ministry, who were there to see what was going to take place and would continue to watch as Jesus' burial would also take place. We continue on. Therefore, because it was the preparation day, that the bodies should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who was crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and immediately blood and water came out. And he who has seen has testified, and his testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth so that you may believe. For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled, not one of his bones shall be broken. And again another scripture says, they shall look on him whom they pierced. Well, these verses talk about the preparation day, a day of preparation. The next day was going to be a, a very important festival for the Jews in that time, sort of like our celebration of, of Easter. And the next day was also the Sabbath day. And the law was for the Jewish people that no one could work on the Sabbath day. There was also an Old Testament law that God had given to his people that they were not allowed to leave any dead bodies overnight. That's found in Deuteronomy chapter 21. And so the Jews then come to Pilate and because of this very special holiday that was coming up the next day, which began at six o'clock in the evening at sundown, they asked that Pilate would speed up the process of the death of, the, of these men 
by breaking their legs. In the previous lesson, when we were studying the crucifixion, we learned that part of the way that a person would die in crucifixion was by suffocating. The people were able to push up with their legs and that would allow them to breathe, continuing uh, the process of, of living. But if they were to break their legs, they wouldn't be able to push off and so they would suffocate more quickly. So the Jews asked Pilate then to break the legs of these criminals, as well as Jesus, in order to speed this process up so that the bodies could be taken down and they wouldn't be there for the Sabbath day. Well, Pilate granted the request. When they came to the first criminal, they broke his legs and they checked the other man and they broke his legs as well. But when they came to Jesus, he was already dead. Now the Romans weren't about to allow someone to survive crucifixion. And so to ensure that Jesus was dead, they took a spear and ran a spear up through his side. And John tells us that blood and water came out. This would indicate that the buildup inside the body, the, the blood and the water, that he really was dead. It, it, it proved to the soldiers that Jesus really had died. Now, the one who gives this witness in the second paragraph is John himself. John who was there at the cross and he says he's telling us all of these things in order that we might believe that Jesus really died. He also points to what happened at Jesus, that his legs were not broken and that his side was pierced, that the Romans in those two things, not breaking his legs and piercing his side, fulfilled two Old Testament scriptures that prophesied how Jesus would die, that not one of his bones would be broken and that they would pierce his side. So Jesus' death was a fulfillment of God's plan of salvation, but also a fulfillment to the very detail of how that plan of salvation would be carried out. We go on with the burial now of Jesus. And after these things, when evening had come, because it was the preparation day, that is, the day before the Sabbath, behold, there came a rich man from Arimathea, a city of the Jews named Joseph, who himself had also become a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews. He was a good and just man, who himself was also waiting for the kingdom of God. He was a prominent council member, but he had not consented to their counsel and deed. This man took courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus, that he might take it away. And Pilate marveled that he was already dead. And summoning the centurion, he asked him if he had been dead for some time. And when he found out from the centurion, Pilate gave him permission and commanded the body to be given to Joseph. Then Joseph bought fine linen and came and took the body of Jesus down. Now Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds. Then they took the body of Jesus and wrapped and bound it in strips of linen with the spices, as the custom of the Jews is to bury. This part of our lesson describes the first part of the burial of Jesus. We're introduced to a man by the name of Joseph of Arimathea. We're told that he was a very important man among the Jewish leaders, that he was part of the Sanhedrin or the council, that he was a believer in Jesus, but he wasn't an outward follower of Jesus because he was afraid of what the Jews would think. Well, he had kept the secret for a long time, but now when he sees that they had condemned Jesus, who was innocent, and that Pilate had had him put to death, Joseph comes forward. He comes to Pilate and he asks that he might be given the body of Jesus, that he might take it down and bury it himself. Pilate finds out that Jesus is dead and then gives Joseph permission to take the body. Joseph goes away and buys linen, strips of cloth that would be used in order to wrap the body of Jesus. And Nicodemus, another man who was also a Jewish leader, who had met with Jesus earlier in his ministry in John chapter 3, he too comes. He brings spices, which was what the Jews would use in order to bury the bodies of Jewish people. And these two men came together. They took the body of Jesus down from the cross and they were going to conduct their own burial service. 
Now the Jews at that time would wrap these spices with the body in these strap, strips of linen cloth. And that would help, number one, in order to slow the decay process, but it would also make sure that you wouldn't have horrible smells. If you think about a dead animal, uh, many times those animals will stink. Well, a dead body will decay, and as it decays, it will smell also. So they prepared the body, and they wrapped it in these strips of cloth and with the spices in order to preserve the body of Jesus, to give it a proper burial. It's pretty amazing that these two men, who were both Jewish leaders, who the Gospels tell us at least Joseph had not consented to the death of Jesus, he had disagreed with putting him to death, both now come forward, even though they had been secret disciples of Jesus prior to that, and they make a confession of their faith, their faith in Jesus as the Son of God, just as the centurion had done earlier. But these two men are willing to sacrifice their reputation in order to bury the body of Jesus, to do what was the right thing to do. We go on in our lesson. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, Joseph's own new tomb that was hewn out of the rock in which no one had yet been laid. Therefore, because of the Jews' preparation day, that day was the preparation, and the Sabbath drew near, because the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. And the women who had come with him from Galilee followed after. And Mary Magdalene was there, and the other Mary, the mother of Josie, sitting opposite the grave. They observed the tomb and where and how his body was laid. And Joseph rolled a large stone against the door of the tomb and went away. And the women returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils. And they rested on the Sabbath day according to the commandment. So these verses discuss how the burial of Jesus took place. The death of Jesus took place about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And the next day would begin at about 6 p.m. So they had about a three-hour window. And during those three hours, Joseph had to go to Pilate. He had to ask for the body of Jesus. They had to check and make sure that Jesus was dead. They would have to, Joseph would have to go out and buy the materials that were, were necessary for the body of Jesus. They would have to take Jesus' body down. And by the time they had done all of that, it would be getting very close to 6 o'clock in the evening. And at 6 o'clock, they couldn't do any more work according to Jewish law. So the Bible tells us that Joseph had a tomb that he had carved out of the stone that was very close to where the cross was, where Calvary was. And because it was nearby, they decided to place the body of Jesus there, in that tomb. It's pretty amazing that this all took place. This too was in fulfillment of another scripture in the Old Testament in Isaiah 53 that tells us that even though Jesus was crucified with criminals, numbered with the transgressors, he would be with the rich in his death. Jesus was placed in a rich man's tomb in which no one had yet been laid. Now that might seem like a strange concept, concept to us because we don't reuse graves today. But in Jewish culture, they would carve out a section out of the rock and place a body there until the body would decay. And once the body had decayed, they would take the bones out and they would put the bones in a smaller box called an ossuary. And that would then be placed somewhere else and they would reuse the tomb for another body that would be left for decay. So this was the process that the Jews had. It might seem strange to us, but it was completely normal and common for the Jews of that day. As Joseph and Nicodemus take care of the burial of Jesus, laying it in this tomb that isn't very far away, we're told that the women the followers of Jesus, they watched what was taking place. They saw where Jesus was placed and how he was buried, and they go home wanting to be involved in their own burial to prepare spices that they would then bring back after the Sabbath day. That would lead us to the next lesson, the resurrection of Jesus on Easter Sunday. We have one more detail that we need to cover, though, in our lesson for today, which took place on the following day, on the Sabbath day, on Saturday. There were told, on the next day, which followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees gathered together to Pilate, saying, 
Sir, we remember while he was still alive how that deceiver said, After three days I will rise. Therefore command that the tomb be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say to the people, He has risen from the dead. So the last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard. Go your way. Make it as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. Following the death and the burial of Jesus, the Jews continued to approach Pilate. They said, we're concerned that the disciples may steal Jesus' body away because he spoke about raising himself from the dead. And so guard, the guards are given to the Jewish leaders. He says, you have a guard. Go ahead, secure the tomb, seal it, and place a guard there to make sure that nobody can take it. So there were three things that were done. They sealed the tomb. They secured the, the tomb so that it couldn't be opened. And they put a guard there at the tomb in order to make sure that the disciples would not be able to come and steal the body of Jesus away. Little did they know that this extra measure of security would only, certainly it would not prevent the resurrection of Jesus, but it would all also seal their own doom in pointing out that no, they couldn't have stolen the body of Jesus, so he must have ra been raised from the dead when his body was no longer there. As we consider this lesson, there's a couple of important points for us to consider. We've, we've talked about the reality of the suffering, the death, and the, and the burial of Jesus but also the implications of that. There are three foundational truths to the Christian faith, and that would be the life of Jesus, the death of Jesus, and the resurrection of Jesus. In the life of Jesus, Jesus lived the life that God required us to live, but we were not able to live. He does that in our place as our substitute. The death of Jesus, it secures for us the payment for our sins that we owed to God and could not pay, Jesus endured the suffering of death and hell in our place so that we wouldn't have to. And the resurrection of Jesus, it assures us that the victory that Jesus came to win is complete, that it is accepted by the Father and that we have been redeemed. This lesson points to those truths, the life of Jesus, the death of Jesus, and the resurrection of Jesus all in our place and as our substitute. Let's back up a little bit and review the lesson that we have considered. I'm going to ask a few questions and we'll see how well you remember the lesson. From what time to what time did the Gospels tell us that there was darkness over the earth? That's correct. It tells us that from the sixth hour to the ninth hour, which would be from about noon to 3 p.m., the brightest hours of the day, there was darkness over all the land. Jesus cried out seven times from the cross, and one of those statements was, My God, how do you finish the rest of that sentence? My God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? That quotation from Psalm 22. After the death of Jesus, we discussed some of the signs that indicated that Jesus really was who he said he was. One of those signs was the tearing of what? That's correct, the veil or the curtain that was found in the temple. Another sign was that the rocks were broken, there was an earthquake, and that the graves or the tombs were opened and many bodies of those who were buried were raised to life. Do you remember what the declaration was of the centurion when he saw all of these signs at the death of Jesus? What was his proclamation about who Jesus was? He said, truly this was the Son of God. We also talked about how this lesson shows us that in the death of Jesus, the Romans actually fulfilled, unknowingly, two Old Testament Bible references. What was it that they didn't do to Jesus that they did do to the other two criminals that were crucified with Jesus? 
That's right. They didn't break his legs. But in order to assure that he was dead, they did something else instead. What did they do? That's correct. They pierced his side with a spear. Finally, we're introduced to two men who were followers of Jesus, but secret followers who came to assist in the burial of Jesus. What was the name of that one man who went to Pilate and asked to have the body of Jesus released to him? That's correct. His name was Joseph of Arimathea. Arimathea was a city from which he came from. And then the women, when they saw Joseph and Nicodemus take the body of Jesus away, the women were there, and what did they look for? What did they see as they, they saw this process? That's right, they were looking for where the body of Jesus was laid, where they had laid Jesus. On the bottom of page 4 and, and the top of page 5, you have some true and false questions to answer. How would you answer question number one? The Roman soldiers fulfilled Old Testament prophecies when they broke Jesus' legs and pierced his side. Is that true or is that false? You'll notice that part of that sentence is true, but it also contains a false statement. They did not break the legs of Jesus, but they did pierce his side. Number two says... The Holy Spirit filled many believing women to confess Jesus by being near him at the time of his death. Would you say that is true or false? Now that is true. By being there at the cross, they were making a confession about what they believed about Jesus, being willing to be there, even though there might have been fears that they had as well. Number three asks, Joseph and Nicodemus were confessing their faith in Jesus when they buried him. Would you say that is true or false? That too is true. They were too making a confession about what they believed about Jesus as the Son of God, that he really was innocent, just as a centurion had, by asking for the body of Jesus and taking the time to bury his body. Number four. Joseph and Nicodemus placed themselves in no danger by asking for Jesus' body and then burying it. That is false. Joseph and Nicodemus would have been placing themselves in danger. The Jews were already upset with Jesus and with many of his followers. They had had Jesus put to death. <laughs> Joseph and Nicodemus, question number four, Joseph and Nicodemus placed themselves in no danger by asking for Jesus' body and then burying it. This statement is false. Joseph and Nicodemus had been hiding for fear of the Jews and it was possible that the Jews who had just had Jesus put to death could also take things out on them maybe removing their position or maybe doing something harmful to them. And so they were going out on a limb. They were putting their confidence in God and making a public confession about their faith in Jesus. Question number five. It is always easy to confess our faith in Jesus in our world today. Would you say that that is true or false? Well, it is certainly easier for us in the country that we live in today than it is for many people in other countries that are hostile to Christianity. But it can also be difficult, can't it? Many times we have friends or we have teachers or people in our families that are not Christian. And many times they don't want to hear about what Jesus has done. And so while we might not be hurt or even killed because of our Christian faith, it can be difficult at times because the world rebels against the message of Jesus as our Savior. Finally, number six. We should confess our faith in Jesus only when it is safe to do so. Now again, this one is also false. 
just as the women sacrificed in order to come and stand there and see the death of Jesus, as John there approached the cross of Jesus, as Joseph and Nicodemus came and asked for the body of Jesus, sacrificing even their physical well-being, there are times where we too should stand on the truth of who Jesus is, even if the world doesn't like it. This is an important calling that the Lord has given to us and an opportunity for us to bear witness to the world. The Lord doesn't promise that nothing bad will ever happen to us, but he does promise that if we remain faithful to his word and stand on the truth of his word, that he will be with us even unto death. What a joyful message that is and a reminder for us in our lives and in our Christian witness. There are several passages for you to look at over the course of this coming week. I would encourage you to memorize at least one of the passages that are listed there. There are four listed in your lesson. Possibly 2 Timothy 1 verse 10, which says, Our Savior, Jesus Christ, has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Jesus has conquered death, and by conquering death, he has given us the hope of life and a life in which our body will not die, immortality, eternal life, because of his victory over sin and death. Let's close with prayer. Lord, help me to appreciate all that you did for me by dying on the cross for all my sins. Fill me with your spirit so that I will confess you always. In your name I pray. Amen. I'd encourage you to go back and take a look at the activities that you do have in your lesson. There's a couple of them that deal with uh, reading through and studying hymns and what those hymns mean to us regarding the death of Jesus and his resurrection. Work on that memory passage over the coming week and try to get that memorized so that you can recite it without looking at it. Whenever we recite and put those memory passages into our own hearts and minds, uh, the Lord is working through that and encouraging us through it as well. Thanks for watching again. We hope that you'll join us next time for the resurrection of Jesus.